All right, hello everybody. How's it going? Yeah. My name is Phil Greenspan. I'm on the developer strategy team at Oculus. Uh, I'm here today to talk about preparing your app for launch. Um, I've been doing this at Oculus for a few years now. Uh, you might recognize this picture. Uh, this is from the original Oculus website where uh, one day we needed somebody, anybody, to put a headset on and take a picture, and that was me. I was the only guy around. <laughs> so, I've been shipping DK1s at GDC since launch. I ended up building and designing a lot of Oculus Share, which was our original content distrib distribution platform. It's a great place for developers to host content. Eventually, we uh, decided the store needed to level up a little bit, so we tried to upgrade it, add some really high-quality content, and we've been growing ever since. Um, over the course of this time, I designed a lot of the app submission process, wrote a fair number of our store policies, reviews, test cases, you're welcome or I'm sorry, whichever one. Uh, at some point, I was proud to say I played every single thing that was submitted to us, every single thing that was on the store, uh, but due to the growth of this community, I mean, since OC1 to now, there's way too much content for me to play, which is awesome and also kind of sad because I just want to play VR all day long. Uh, but with that in mind, we've been shifting a lot of our programs and a lot of the work that we do on the developer strategy and publishing team in general to shift from one to many one-to-one uh, -one programs where we help developers uh, with their specific project, specific details, specific elements, to one-to-many programs where we can try and help developers more broadly, where we can try and reach as many developers with broad lessons that can apply to all sorts of different projects rather than individual ones. So with that in mind, we're going to kick into some of this talk, which is a lot of those themes. This is going to be a lot of things that I would used to say to developers one-on-one. -on -one. Now I'm trying to say it to all of you all at once. Uh, but it's general truths that are good for launching any app anywhere, and a few of them will be specific truths for launching apps or games on our store. Uh, on that note, I'm probably going to switch between apps and games a lot. They mean the same thing for the purposes of this talk. I just play a lot of video games. Okay, so we're going to have three key sections here. There's pre-production. We'll get into best practices and launch process. First things first, we're going to be talking about how to evaluate your project. You've got this idea for a game. You've got this idea for an app. Now we have to decide if it's something that is, one, worth building, two, worth building in VR, and you know, three, we'll meet the goals that you have for the company and the project overall. We're going to kick into some best practices. These will be things you want to keep in mind early and often all throughout the development process. Uh, we're going to talk about the submission process and the timeline, how much time we need, how much time we think you'll need to successfully launch a game as well as some other things like whether or not you should go into early access or target a full launch, what marketing and community building will look like uh, as you prepare for that big launch day, right? And we're going to get into that launch day, that whole launch process, including what you should be doing that day, what you should be doing after that, including content updates, including sales and promotions. Um, and finally, I'll end up talking a little bit about a few of our programs, including the Developer Center, things like Oculus Start, Oculus Launchpad, uh, which are great uh, resources and tools to help uh, bring your game to our platform smoothly and successfully. So first things first, you've got this great idea. It's awesome. What are you going to make? Well, way back, way back in the day, we had a DK1, but we didn't have any content for it. So I downloaded a Unity demo of a race car and started driving around. We set up a wheel, sitting in the office, and this is apparently what I do at work, is play racing games. And it was super awesome and it was great, but I'm really bad at racing games, and I had never played one in VR before, so the first thing I did was crash into a wall. It happens. So the next thing I did, and this was actually very cool, but my instinctive reaction was to lean over my shoulder and look back out the, out the rear view uh, window. I'd never done that in a video game before, that was fun. But that's when I realized that this car model I was in was at this very tiny little window in the back. I couldn't see what was going on. So I went to Maya, ripped off the roof, decided I wanted to drive around a convertible. And that was cool. And then we all got sick and we learned about uh, fast moving objects in your periphery vision. So we said, okay, okay, that wasn't, that wasn't right. But we built a demo, we tried it, we tested it, we learned. So we said, okay, well, let's build a mech and we'll close off the periphery. We'll have people move a little bit slower. It'll be like walking, but you'll have the player be seated so they'll psychologically feel like they're they're not moving, right? And that was cool, and that worked, and we had some mech games, and you know, I love giant robots, so that's fun. But it felt a little bit like a shortcut, like we were kind of almost cheating a little bit, like it was walking without walking, and 
And we knew that the answer had to be VR specific. It had to be something that made the platform shine and be unique, right? VR isn't about shortcuts, it's about building something new and amazing and wonderful. Right? So we said, you know what's really cool and amazing and wonderful? Spaceships. <laughs> okay, we've got a cockpit, people aren't moving, but it also doesn't feel like it's a shortcut, they're doing something different. We learned about horizon lines. So, oh, that'll help make sure people don't get sick if they don't have a strong horizon line. And then we were playing really fun space games, and that was cool, that was good. But the important lesson in that was that all throughout those developments, we had an idea, we built the idea, we tested the idea, we learned we did something wrong, and then we moved on and grew, right? And I'm telling that story because I want you to pay attention to that important last point, which is we built the demos and we figured out what we liked about them and doubled down. We figured out what we didn't like about them and we moved on. And one of the hard things about VR is that you don't necessarily know until you get into a headset. So it's worth it to take the time before you fully commit, before you fully spin up a project, to just get the idea out of your head, into a headset, and find out. Find out if it's fun. Find out if it's any good. And then you can commit and continue building. And that's what we think the demo is for. You know, when I first started making video games on my own as indie games, I'd worked at a company before that, I knew those games were, for me, super fun to play. But they were not going to be smash hits. They were not going to be majorly successful, profitable video games. But they weren't meant to be. They were meant to show that I could build in Unity. They were meant to give me an opportunity to interact with the app stores and learn what the process was. And from that perspective, they were very successful. They were able to validate the key important things that I needed to learn at the time. They did not yield millions and millions of dollars. They weren't supposed to, and that was okay. We also, as we were building, one of the important lessons we learned was that some of the things we built felt like VR, and that's a very hard thing to describe. But as you're building this demo, think to yourself, is this, is this a game that needs to be in VR? Is this meant for VR? When players play this, are they gonna say, wow, this is what VR was made for? And the answer doesn't have to be yes, but I want you to think about the question, and I want you to think about what that answer is for your title. Because the truth is, VR still has a pretty small total addressable market. There are only so many headsets on the market, and there are more every day. The lines are going up and to the right. We have Quest coming out. It's going to be cool. But if you're building a game for the total audience of gamers, the solution might be to build a VR game with a non-VR component. Uh, the solution could be to take that cool VR demo that you did and just say, actually, this is just a, a pancake game, a flat game. And that's OK, too. But the lesson I'm trying to impart, the, the lesson we learned, was try it and find out. OK, so the next bit is you've built your demo. You know that it works in VR. And this goes back to why I built my first demos, which is what is, what is the point? Why are we trying to do this? What is our success metric? In some cases, that success metric is revenue. I mean, in most cases, it's revenue. For most people here, they're trying to build companies, they're trying to build businesses. You want to continue to pay your engineers and your artists and all of those things, and, you know, and, th and that's good. But what's important is that some games are trying to build companies, and some games are trying to get beer money or pizza money, and that's cool too, right? The important bit with this revenue prediction is finding out before you built the game, before you ship the game, before you spend all your money, how much money are you going to need to get back out at the end of it in order to stay in the game, in order to stay profitable, in order to keep your business going? Because that can be very different orders of magnitude. You might need $10,000, you might need $10 million. Which one of those goals you have really changes the design of the game that you're building. It also changes how we're going to interact with you because there are certain goals that we want to help you hit. If that goal is revenue, we're going to care more about things like store placement, sales, featuring, whatever. If the goal is concurrency, you're going to build a different game for that, right? Multiplayer games, concurrency is incredibly important. And there's other ways you can build your game, including events, including uh, you know, cross-platform play to drive people to it. And what we want is for you to, early on in the process, predict, I'm going to need, this is a eight 
player multiplayer game, so I'm going to need n number of players online at any given time to make sure everybody has a good experience. And if I don't have n number of players, we won't be successful. Cool, that's exactly what we want to know, because then we'll do everything we can to make sure you have that many players in the game for those major events. You know, the last bit could be that your success metric is retention, right? You might be building a software as a service type of product. You might be building something where you need people to keep coming back over time. That's cool too, but you're going to build a very different game than if you were building one for revenue or concurrency, right? You're going to be planning sustained content updates. You're going to spend more time community building. This might be a narrative game where you get people coming back to learn what happened to the characters, right? Again, the point here is, is pick one, make a call, and go for it. Yeah, I tell this story about uh, Babe Ruth, who is, you know, hailed as the greatest baseball player of all time, or, you know, whatever. And the point wasn't that he was the greatest baseball player of all time. That's not what we remember about Babe Ruth. And besides the chocolate bar, I remember Babe Ruth calling his shots. You know, he says, I'm, I'm not just going to hit a home run. I'm going to do it on this pitch, and I'm going to hit it over there. And that's why people remember Babe Ruth. And that's what we want you to do with these success metrics. Call your shots, measure your success. That way we can know if you were happy with making games in the VR space, which is, of course, what we want. Okay, last thing is you're designing your game is to think about the audience that you're designing the game for. And the audience that you're designing the game for isn't just the customers. It's the industry, it's the community, it's the ecosystem, and I'll talk a little bit about each one of those things. You know, when you look at the industry, you're not building this game all by yourself. You're building this game as part of a thriving industry of video game developers, both VR and out of VR, or apps or games, whatever. Look at what other people are doing. Look at what other people are you know, excited about. Has there been a new locomotion mechanic? Has there been a new camera mode that somebody's come up with? Take their learnings, you know, stand on the shoulders of giants. Another bit is to look at the community itself, right? As it turns out, there are trends in the world, and some people like playing some games more than others, and you can feed into that, right? You can build the game that people want to play. Um, go on Reddit, go on Twitter, find out what people are talking about, find out what people are, are really loving, and incorporate those things into your design elements. The last bit is to look at the ecosystem overall, and this is the interaction between other developers, other customers, as well as us, Oculus, the platform holders. You know, Follow the trends, and the trick here is that games and apps, they take a long time to make. So what you want to be doing is targeting not just what you're building and not just where the audience is right now, but when you're done building and where the audience will be. And that's why we say look at the ecosystem, because it is growing, it is thriving, it is changing. And we want to help you predict where it's going to be when your title is ready. Okay, so that was a lot of pre-production, a lot of speculative work, a lot of trial and error. Um, but we're moving on into the best practices section of my talk, and this is going to be where we're going to pull everything we've got together. You've been making art, you've got engineers working, PMs are tracking everything, it's great. You looked into the market, there appears to be a good fit between your product and what people want. You've got a demo, it's awesome, you've showed it to your friends and family, they love it, they validated that this is something you should continue building. So let's get this thing ready to submit. First things first is you got to head to dashboard.oculus.com and learn about our store submission pipeline. There's a ton of details on the website. I highly encourage you all to look at it. I'm going to flash up the URLs later in the talk. Um, but I do want to cover a couple of key important themes with our submission process to help you smooth it out, make sure there aren't any kind of gotchas. So, the first thing's first. For any submission, between the first time you send us your game and when you want to launch it, we need two weeks. That two weeks is basically as short as we could get the time to make sure that everybody is happy. Ha everybody including you as developers and our store team uh, without lighting their hair on fire. Uh, we will almost always get you feedback faster than this two-week period, but this also includes a little buffer for you to implement whatever changes we might require. Of course, the more time you give us, the more time, the more things we can do, right? Two weeks is the minimum. That'll get us to a place where we can put your app on the store. 
With more time, we can talk about pricing, we can talk about featuring, we can talk about uh, any kind of major events or, you know, we announced the new in-home assets that we could get you building so that when your game launches, there can be some cool achievements for all your fans. But that kind of stuff is hard to do at the last minute, so the longer of a lead time you give us, the more we can do to help. With that in mind, we want to make sure that the feedback that we give you is helpful and useful and valuable both to you uh, and to the, the overall quality of your title. So one of the things that we ask for when you ask for feedback is to really target those requests. I mean, there is nothing that I would like better in my life than to go to work each day, put on a headset, play video games, tell people what I think. Unfortunately, I don't have quite that much time and we have far too many games to do that. So it's really helpful if when you send us a game, you say, this is what I'm wondering. This bit is locked, this design element is locked, but this design element is flexible. We don't have a launch date picked yet, but we do have these restrictions on when we can launch. Maybe you know how much you wanna price your game for, but you don't know if you should do a launch discount. Well, that's, that's where we can help in, uh, hop in and help out. One of the things I get a lot of feedback requests on is early access. Should I launch my game into early access? And this is something I spend a ton of time thinking about because a lot of developers want to do it. And there are a lot of really good reasons to go into early access and even more bad reasons to go into early access. So I'm going to highlight a few of the successful areas we've seen. First of all, going into early access is your launch. You only get one launch. So many devs come to me and they say, I want to go into early access and then we'll have a second launch in six months. And it's like, that's not how it works. Your game's already out. It's out. The world's seen it. That's it. That's your launch. So make sure that that first launch, that early access launch, is amazing. You do have marketing. This is not a world where you just launch it to see because then you just missed your own launch and that's kind of sad. The successful early access games are the ones that go into the process with something they want to learn. And this harkens back to the calling your shots success metrics bit. Here, we want you to say, I'm going into early access because I want to test character balance. I want to go into early access because I have a multiplayer game and I need to build that community before we ship the full title so that it's populated. Maybe I'm going into early access because we have the core 60 second game loop, we just don't have enough content yet, so we need to iterate and continue to test and we need feedback. Those are great reasons to go to early access. But whatever the reason you have, have an exit strategy. Define what the complete game is. And this is, on the one hand, really great for customers. They're gonna feel much more empowered to buy your game if they know what that finished product is and likely when it's gonna happen. But it's also for you just to give you a little bit of, a little peace of mind a little bit of calm, a little bit of a target, because feature creep is real, and product scope grows. But if you have a clear target that you're working towards, one, the feedback that you get from your customers is gonna be towards that end goal, and two, you're gonna have the peace of mind of having a target that you're working towards and a finish line, which is really important with game development, because this stuff can, it can go for years, and it, when you're spending years and years of your passion working on this game, and it never feels like it launches, it can, it can wear on both you and your customers. So what we want you to do is have a clear target, have a clear metric that you are trying to achieve with it, and run at that goal. And we'll try and speed you along as best as we can. Okay. Uh, this next bit, I'm gonna talk about advertising your game. And I do talk to some devs that say, yeah, you know, we're gonna launch our game, we're gonna stay in stealth mode, and then we're gonna launch it, and the whole world's gonna see it, it's gonna be great, we're gonna make tons of money, it's gonna be awesome. And it's like, yeah, but, you know, if you build it, they will come, that's true. But if you build it and then tell people about it, more of them will come. And, and that's, we just want to re remind you that, you know, marketing helps, marketing works, advertisement works. Um, so, but there's a few different ways you can market your game. You know, first and early on, you can market it to the industry itself, to other game developers. And this is a great opportunity to talk about technical problems that you've solved, um, an interesting market learning that you figured out through that early access process, whatever it is. Maybe it's writing a development blog for our dev center. That's a 
we love when developers come and write dev blogs because it feeds back to that one-to-many bit that we're, we're trying to shift into. We want when one developer figures something out for every developer to figure that out. And we want you all to all do it together, collaboratively, rising tide, all boats, you know the thing. Next up is building an online community. You know, here we've got Facebook, because the big blue, but this could be anywhere. This could be on Reddit, uh, this could be a funny Twitter handle, you know, I have an Instagram for my dog, whatever, just make sure you're out there telling people about the game and building that community early and often. And lastly, market direct to consumers, right? This could be, you know, targeted Facebook ads for people that have indicated that they like your game, um, or it could be just about anything else, but whatever it is, get in front of the customers, the people that are gonna buy the game and tell them about it. You know, and it doesn't just have to be the game you're telling them about. Tell them the story of your studio. Video game developers are freaking wizards. Like, you can conjure dragons and shoot fireballs and you can make people fly through space. That is, that's wizardry. And people love to hear the story of how you achieved that goal. So tell that story and people will be more likely to identify with your studio and play your games because of it. Especially if you have a long-term multi-game plan. Okay, so you've told people about your game, you've built a cool demo, you're ready to launch, you finished the submission process, everything was smooth, you gave us plenty of time, have a party, right? It's launch day, this is the best. And you're done with your work because you've spent years working on this game and you launched it and now you can go on vacation, right? Wrong. Welcome to the end game. I don't know if any of you play uh, MMOs, but most games now have a grind where you work really, really hard, and then you get to the end, and that's when the game begins. And that's a little bit like making video games, right? Once you launch your game, that's, that's when the hard work starts, and it's a very different set of skills than the pre-production and development skills. Um, the good news is, is we have a ton of cool services to help you post-launch. One of them, and this is at launch, have a launch discount. 10 or 15% will really get a lot of players uh, to kind of get over that mental hurdle to pull the trigger and buy the game. Or uh, another great way is to watch your analytics. Every game is gonna go through the same general boom for their uh, launch process where they're gonna have a bunch of sales. That's gonna be great. And then it will naturally trickle off. And you can watch for that uh, trail off. And as soon as you start seeing it slope down, Put your game on sale and get that bump back up. Now, you can also participate in platform promotions. These are things like the winter sale, things like the summer sale. And the intent of these is to create opportunities where a ton of players are coming to the store with high purchase intent. What we want you to do is make sure that you're in front of their faces, right? If you already have 10 times the number of users coming in with a 5x increased purchase intent and your game's not on sale during that period of time, they're just gonna buy something else. So make sure you participate in those sales. Make sure you participate in those events because you're gonna see a massive lift in all of your other metrics. Uh, lastly is you don't have to wait for us. You can participate in and generate your own events. We see these as being really successful for multiplayer games that are trying to boost concurrency. They can host a free weekend. Uh, you can do cross-platform events where you have a Go game, a Quest game, and a Rift game, and you can try and drive all players to them at the same time. That can really help. But regardless, what we're trying to do is give players a reason to buy your game. That's what these promotions are for. Uh, whether what shape that takes is really custom and, and dependent on the title and dependent on those pre-set out goals that you have but these are all good ways to help achieve it regardless. Now, once you've launched the game, you can put it on sale, but making it cheaper doesn't always help. Sometimes you already have the right price point or what you just need is more content. Uh, maybe it's a new bit of DLC so you can continue to maintain revenue that way. Maybe your goal was retention so you can release a free content update and more people will come back and tell their friends about how great it is that you as a developer are giving them 
more things to do. Uh, but regardless, keep in mind that mindshare is expensive. People can only think about so many things at once, and getting somebody to try your game for the first time is a high, you know, emotional, psychological, financial, and time commitment. So if you are able to get people over that hurdle, keep them. Do everything you can to keep them there. Now, that could be building new content updates, and it could be building an entirely new game or a sequel. And again, this is going to be very dependent on your project in specific, and I can talk more about, you know, given the details and the scope and the shape of your title, what the right answer is for you. There is no right answer for everyone. But the important bit is that you keep working and you keep listening to the community and you keep building content and you keep updating your game because people will hear it, they will see it, they will feel it, and they'll respond positively. The catch is that there's always an opportunity cost. Now, if you build content updates, well, if it's a paid DLC, there's going to be a high bit of friction and you already have a limited target audience because they're, you're only targeting people who already have your game. If it's a free content update, you're going to get more people in, but you won't make the revenue. If it's a sequel, you're going to have to spend a lot more time building and have a significantly different thing to make it sequel worthy. But you're going to be able to host a bundle so that anybody who bought your old game can get a discount and buy the new game too, and people will respond really positively to a developer who has taken an idea, continued to work on it. And there's a lot of uh, faith and trust. I'm more willing to buy a sequel of a good game because I know that it's going to be good than take a flyer and buy some game I've never heard of. And that's what we talk about with mindshare and opportunity cost. Okay, I also want to talk about a few resources and tools as we uh, wrap up these kind of three key sections, the before, middle, and after of the talk. We've built a demo, submitted it to the store, we launched it, we ran, ran some sales, continued to maintain content updates, and that's the launch process. But there are a few things, a few services that we at Oculus offer to help make that whole very complicated thing a little bit easier and to help you get involved. First things first is developer support. Uh, we get a lot of questions on how to use our software and a lot of questions on how to launch games, and this is where you should go to ask them. First, first things first, that's your first stop. We have a whole team at work. They know our stack. They know our tools. If you have a technical question, they can help. If you're a little bit earlier in the process and you're still getting started in the VR industry, we have Oculus Start. This is a program, yeah! <laughs> this is a program that we set up. Uh, it largely grew out of a lot of our intent with Oculus Share, where we wanted to create a world where developers who were just getting into VR for the first time had an opportunity to get a direct line into our team. You know, ha there's a few custom events. I know there was a dinner this week. You can get some hardware through this program, and this is a great way to get your first entry into the VR space with our support. Uh, Launchpad, on the other hand, is a little bit different of a program. Launchpad is specifically meant for diverse creators making diverse content. You know, it would be so easy for Oculus and other VR companies to target 18 to 35 year old males that like shooters. Nailed it. But that's not the future of VR. The future of VR is so much more. I mean, you all know this, right? I don't need to preach to the choir here, but the future of VR includes all sorts of different people doing all sorts of different things. And Launchpad is part of our effort to make sure that happens, and it happens sooner than it would otherwise happen. So if you are from a diverse background, from an underrepresented group, or if you want to make content for those groups, Launchpad is an amazing opportunity where you can get a direct line in to some of our most senior engineers. I think there, m there are a few other programs where we'll bring you into the office, and you can meet other Launchpad creators and work on projects together. And this is an amazing program uh, run by Ebony, who is a total all-star. Okay, almost done. Next up is 
a few tools for when you're actually submitting your project. If you're going to take a picture of a slide, this is the slide to take a picture of. Because these are the three links that I send to every single developer when they say, I have a game and I want to launch and I, that my, it. It could basically be an out-of-office reply. It's just, here are the links. Go to them. The ICOS Performance Profiler, uh, you can run this while you're running your game, and it will identify any dropped frames, it will identify any performance hitches, anything that would cause us to bounce your game back to you for performance reasons can be identified using this tool. Making sure that you run it early and often and throughout your development process will make it so that when you do submit your game to us, it's a nice clean sweep and you can get it through without any technical hurdles. Similarly, we have the VRC validator. Uh, VRC is our virtual reality checks and this is a quick bit of software that will do run a static analysis on your binary and we'll just make sure that everything's configured properly. This is looking at the manifest file. This is making sure all the checkboxes in Unity are properly checked. And there's, <laughs> there's nothing that feels worse than having to bounce a game because a developer forgot to check a checkbox, right? Like, we, we want you to have a successful launch, and that just feels bad for everybody. So make sure you run the validator. Everybody, your, your app will go through with flying colors. Everybody will be happy. And for anything that isn't covered by performance or our technical checks, will be contained in our submission guidelines, which is the third link here. The submission guidelines contain some of our more uh, subjective or non-technical policies. Um, anything that couldn't be captured with a static analysis is captured in these uh, submission policies, including things like asset sizing, where your logo is, how big the logo should be. It'll include things like pricing uh, support and where, you know, what international pricing looks like and how you can arrange sales and when, when you can arrange sales, because there are some laws with that. And the submission guidelines contains all of that. And I think that's just about it. This is Booker. He is my dog. He, I include him in every talk that I do. This is also my email address and my Twitter handle. That is his Instagram handle, so don't expect to find me there. It's just going to be pictures of dogs. Um, hope you enjoyed Booker. Welcome to Q&A. If you have any questions about launching a game, uh, I would love to hear it. Also, thank you all for coming. This was my first Oculus Connect talk, and I'm so glad that anybody showed up. <laughs>